Uh, so th we have two panels um, th today for this section, and the first will be this, the state policy and procedures focus. Um, so I'd like to invite up uh, Martin Harris and Heather Bar uh, Barthel, um, who can help us take a look at the state approach, uh, the state agency approach to this fee calculation issue. And I guess if we could start with um, Martin Harris. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Chairman Barbie and Chairman Ferguson and uh, members of the committee for having us here today. Um, as you said, I'm Martin Harris. I'm the State Legislative Officer for MDOT. And um, just to let you know for, for later, I, I'm uh, joined here, if, if there are any specific questions later, um, by Mr. Mike Hafley, who is the Deputy Director of our Office of Procurement, and Cheryl Brown Whitfield, who is with our uh, OAG's office, our Deputy OAG. So um, I'm pleased to come before you today to talk about um, PIA requests and uh, including how we recoup some of the costs expended in connection with preparing our responses to them and, of course, the appeal process as well. Um, I want to state up front that MDOT believes citizens have a right to obtain information from their government. That's kind of how we, that's the, the basis from which we proceed on all of this. We take these requests very seriously and we want to be as responsive and accountable as possible to the request, to the request that we receive. Um, some of what I'm going to say has actually been covered by Mr. Snyder already, so I'll try and shorten that and try not to repeat. But um, um, our PIA requests are handled pursuant to, one, the uh, Maryland Public Information Act, Title 10, Subtitle 6 of the state government article. Uh, and also, um, our PIA regulations are under COMAR 110113. Uh, those regs, uh, as inferred by uh, Mr. Snyder, they set out the procedures that we utilize for um, handling the requests and inspections and copying of records. Um, as he said, the law allows us to charge reasonable amounts for the time spent locating, reviewing, and preparing documents after those first two hours and for making copies and for those costs associated with that. Uh, now, notwithstanding that authority, our policy is to facilitate timely access to the disclosable records by taking steps to minimize those costs to the person who's asking for the information. Now, for us, the uh, official custodian of records may be MDOT uh, through the Secretary's Office or one of our MDOT modal administrations, which includes the State Highway Administration, the previously referred to Motor Vehicle Administration, the Port Administration, the Aviation Administration, the Transit Administration, or the Maryland uh, Transportation Authority. Now, that custodian will adhere to the statutes and regulations consistent with our policy and communicate directly with the requester about the request. And Mr. Snyder talked a little bit about that as well. Um, communication with the requester is always important, but it becomes really important when we are talking about costs being involved. Um, some requests are straightforward and don't involve a lot of documents. In those instances, that access is provided without cost to the requester. However, as he referenced also, um, some PA requests can be very large and generate a large amount of work for the records uh, looking for them and also then obviously a lot of expenses for the state uh, agency. Um, as he talked about, these are oftentimes things where the re records involved are voluminous files or reports or they cover a lot of years. Um, the records are archived or they are uh, documents that have to be reviewed to, for information that is protected by law. So in those instances, the process that we uh, go through, which Mr. Snyder touched on, is, is um, we perform a preliminary review of the quest, and we make a good faith estimate of the costs that are related to the search, review, and preparing the documents to be responsive to it. Um, that that uh, process entails us determining the number of hours it will take to locate, review, uh, redact, and produce those records that are responsible to the PIA. And we also determine the personnel that would be involved in responding to the request. And, we, uh, and the fully loaded uh, hourly rates that are associated with that personnel. Next, we do a simple math. We multiply the estimated number of hours for that person uh, by that applicable rate to come up with the total estimate for the work required to provide the response. Now, additional costs can also be assessed, again, as Mr. Snyder um, uh, referenced, for other expenses, uh, for things like programming costs, and there was a mention of the MVA there as well. And depending on the format of the document production and the number of pages involved, we may add copying costs. We are uh, an agency that uses the 25 cents per page um, uh, number that Mr. Snyder referenced. Um, but we also generally do not assess those costs unless we're talking about a large amount of uh, paper. And um, those costs are not uh, charged at all if those um, records are produced by email. Um, after determining the cost to the agency, we will inform the requester of the estimate. 
and when the amount is significant, we uh, will request a prepayment before beginning the production effort. I think it's important to mention that MDOT tries to minimize those costs again up front by working with the requester much as Mr. Snyder talked about to refine those requests. And a lot of times it's possible to really break those uh, requests down and narrow their scope. As he said, sometimes a requester doesn't know precisely what they're asking for. Um, and they'll submit very broad requests when they're really looking for something that's much more specific. Um, we will try to narrow that down. Um, oftentimes they're just looking for something within a uh, narrow set of dates or something that's been paid to a specific contractor or something like that, and we can use that to narrow the scope of the request. Um, refining the request in that way obviously would result in fewer records having to be searched and produced and also a corresponding reduction in any potential cost that would go along with that. Um, on, the, um, uh, on, on the hearing uh, and appeal side of it, we, we uh, inform the requester that they are entitled to administrative review of the PIA determinations. By, uh, through the OAH uh, upon request and in accordance with uh, proper uh, state government articles. Um, state government article 10623 also allows the request to seek judicial review of MDOT's findings in the appropriate circuit court. Um, I do want to note here, uh, as from talking with our folks on council, that as far as we are aware, at least we can speak for the last, last several years, last decade or so, MDOT has not had a PIA uh, appeal request, at least the, through the Secretary's office. Um, the point of these uh, procedures and processes is to provide that requester with a clear overview of what will take place. We think that's very important. Um, we provide them with an upfront estimate of the cost and the time that we believe are associated required to meet that request and the basis that we utilize for determining them. Providing them with that through that communication can really help to expedite the process and assure that the public has the information that they are entitled to. Um, in a clean and an open and an honest and a direct way. And that's the, the, the basis through which we proceed with these requests. So that basically lays out the process that MDOT uh, utilizes. And with that, I'll be either happy to turn over to Heather or we'll take questions after. Um, let, Heather, if you would give your presentation with a question sure. at the end, Senator. Okay, thank sir, you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having me here. I'm Heather Barth. I'm the Director of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs for the Maryland Department of the Environment. And I brought some of my comrades with me. I have Amanda Dagan, who is our PIA coordinator, and I have Megan Ulrich, who is filling in for our legislative liaison. Um, as Martin said, he and Adam pretty thoroughly went through the PIA process and the statutory requirements for how our agencies handle the PIA request, so I'm not going to repeat anything that they've already said. Um, I will say that MDE is actually right in the middle of the process of revising our operating procedures and we're reviewing our regulations including the fee that we charge and we're also in the middle of um, developing a new more robust PIA database tracking system for us. It's not up and running yet but it, hopefully by the end of the year it will be. Um, and you know because one of the keys is to have open and transparent government and we want to make sure we have consistency with our sister agencies through, we've been working on this for almost a year and a half now, and during that time we have, we have repeatedly reached out to our sister agencies to make sure that what we're doing is consistent with how they run their PIA programs. And much of what um, Adam and Martin described is exactly what MDE is already either already doing or we're going to be moving and instituting. Um, so I thought it would be better if I started out with providing you with some basic factual information about MDE. Um, and how we handle the process. As I mentioned, we have one PIA coordinator, Amanda, who oversees all of the PIA requests for the entire department. And within each of our administrations, we have individuals who are designated to be our PIA liaisons. So we have five individuals who are PIA liaisons, and then we have two additional people that fill in here and there. So for a total of seven people, plus Amanda makes eight. Um, however, at any given time, you know, any of our 900 plus employees may be involved in fulfilling a PIA request. We receive roughly 3,000 PIA requests a year, and the majority of those, um, we did some averaging, roughly 2,500 of those are filled within the 30 day time frame. The 500 or so that take longer than 30 days, these are generally the requests that are very voluminous. There's information that needs to be pulled from multiple sources, multiple sources, administrations, may, maybe even multiple locations, because we do have field offices on the Eastern Shore and in Western Maryland. Um, and then there are those cases where the information needs to be reviewed by the Attorney General's office. And 
those are cases where staff feel that the documents either need to be withheld for confidentiality reasons, but before we withhold them, we want to make sure that the Attorney General's Office does review them um, first to make sure that it's consistent with the withholding provisions of the PIA. Um, this past year, of the 3,000 requests that we received, there was only 12 that requested the fee waiver. Um, and what we do in those cases where a fee waiver is requested is that we have a series of questions that we give them and we ask them to fill it out and then we review it, um, Amanda reviews it, and if we have any questions, we have the Attorney General's office review it. And I can say of the 12 requests we received, we denied all of them. Um, no fee waivers were, at least in this past year. Um, so Martin also mentioned that um, requests for records under the PIA can generate a large amount of work um, for the record custodians. And with the exception of Amanda and one other person, all of our PI liaisons have other job duties. They, they have other assignments. PIA is part of their job, but it's only a portion of it. It doesn't encompass their full-time job duties. So some of the requests we receive are simple, um, like information regarding a rental unit that's registered with our lead program. Those are simple requests, but we receive a very large volume of them. Um, and then we have other requests for information that are very on very complex projects that may span multiple decades, like Sparrows Point. Um, or the Honeywell Allied Signal Site in Baltimore City, which has been receiving quite a bit of press these days. Um, it's not often that we deny a PIA request, and we too frequently work with the requesters to refine what it is they're looking for. Um, you know, we really want to make sure that they hone in on what information they truly need and want and is necessary, and that, you know, cuts back. It saves the requester and the department time or money. So if somebody contacted us and said, I want all your records on the Honeywell site, that's 30 plus years worth of information. It would be a room full of information and thousands and thousands of dollars. Now if what they really want to know is how did we cap the site to make sure pollution isn't leaking out, you know, that's a much more tidy bit of work that we can provide to them at a nominal cost. Um, also mentioned earlier there was some discussion about um, putting information on the web. We are moving towards trying to do that, especially um, Amanda has been doing, has brought a whole new energy to this position, and she's really been looking at where are we getting the most volume of requests. So there is some information that's already up on our website. So if there is, for instance, um, a sewage overflow at a wastewater treatment plant, that's already on our website. You can look it up. We enter the information as fast as we get it in. Um, it's as real time as it can be. Um, there's other information that we're working towards that we're not there yet, um, like our lead registry. Where are the rental units registered? So we're going to hopefully, it's going to cost money, but we're going to try and do this, is have an interactive map on our website where you can either punch in an address or zoom in on the map to see where in Baltimore City are the properties that are registered with our program. Because that would cut back on time and energy and would be free, they could just look on the website and see that. So we're working towards that. Some areas were there already, some areas were not. Um, there are times where we do deny a PIA request. Um, a good example of this just happened this past year. We had a special interest association that contacted us and wanted to um, supply them with all the addresses of all lead poisoned children in 2011. Uh, we denied that request. That's medical information and we, you know, under um, State, state government article section 10-615, we denied that because that would be a HIPAA violation. Um, the association did appeal this request to the Office of Administrative Hearing and OAH upheld our denial. Um, now with regard to the fees that we charge, um, similar to MDOT, we do have a date, the database that we currently use and the new one is preloaded with um, sort of pay scales. So if you fall within a certain category, a certain hourly rate is charged. Um, it's preloaded when we do our estimate. We always give everybody estimates of what we're going to charge before, our, so they have an opportunity to refine the request or say, eh, no, never mind, or yes, go ahead, I want to do it. So it's all preloaded in there. We do, a, we do an estimate of what we think is going to be involved, generate a fee, and then we send a fee letter out to the individual. Um, with regard to the copying fee, we charge 36 cents per page. Um, however, that is one of the things that we are looking at changing, and, and we're looking at to increase it, not decrease it. But we're not, you know, we're not interested in making money. We just want to cover the costs of what is associated with those with those copying costs. So that's it in a nutshell for us. If there's anything I didn't cover that you're interested in, just please let me know. 
Uh, thank you. Um, let me ask you, um, uh, Heather, the question that I asked previously. What, what, how, many of the, how many of these documents at MDE are digitized? Is it a large number? I mean, I, I imagine you have so, certain documents like very large maps that are probably, well, I don't know. Maybe they are digitized. I don't know. Why, why don't I just listen to you? I would say this is very rough, and I'll go back and ask. I want to say about 25% of our documents are digital. Okay. One of the hindrances is there is only so much we can send out by email. If mm -hmm. it's already digitized and we can just email it out, there's not going to be a cost associated with that. But <coughs> what is it, eight megabytes? Eight megabytes, so it's mm -hmm. pretty small. Um, if somebody wanted it in an electronic form, we would try to accommodate them. You'd have to burn it onto a CD or, or, or put it on a thumb drive or something flash like that. Drive, and yeah. today, I just asked Amanda, at least in our experience, now I've only, I've always been involved with the PIA process. I've only been intimately involved with it for like the last year and a half since mm -hmm. Amanda came on board. We don't, we can't recall anybody asking us within the last year and a half to put something on a flash drive. If they did, we, we could certainly do that. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have mapping capabilities. We have the big printers. Um, that's two dollars. So if okay. you want, like, um, not to keep getting hung, hung up on Honeywell, but if you wanted a map of that site, we could produce that for you for two dollars. We do have mapping capabilities in house. Huh. Um, so if a document is uh, requested, let's say I request a document, a letter, or a report. Um, how would I get it? Would I get a Xerox copy? Would you scan it and send it to me digitally? If if, if you wanted, if, you, if it was just a letter, we could we could PDF it and email it out to you. If it was a if it was a record, say a hundred pages long, people do it a number of different ways. Some people want to come in and want to look through the whole record, uh -huh. and then they find after they do that maybe they don't need all hundred pages. They just want twenty five. And we have we have a room on the first floor of our agency that's dedicated just to PIA. Uh -huh. There is a copier in that room. Um, every administration has a code. And I'm sorry, every has a what? A code. So like our land program has a code. So if you're oh, there code. reviewing CLB. land records, you, you punch in a specific code to land. Okay. But what you do is the, the we it's, a, it's on an honor system is we have the PI requester, their forms there, and they write down Joe Smith copied five pages from mm -hmm. this record. And they put it in the box, and then we pick it up, and that becomes part of what we bill them for. And finally, with respect to calculating cost, uh, you say that you take the hourly rate of the individual. You're not um, saying that the person's hourly rate is $30, and there is an indirect benefit charge of 30 percent that you put on time. Yeah, that's just the hourly rate. Yeah, and that's times something that is on our website is that okay. we have exactly the salary grade. So for clerical, which is grade seven and lower, it's ten dollars an hour. So if we know we have an administrative assistant, somebody somebody says to us, I just want the whole file, just have them copy it and mail it to me. Mm -hmm. As long as it's not too voluminous, you know, we'll have them do that. We'll say like, oh it took 45 minutes or, well, you know, the two first two hours are free, but whatever time frame, it's punched in, it generates a bill for them. Okay, thank you. I think one other thing I would like to say, and this is something that we are moving towards that MDOT is doing, is that right now we don't require that anybody pay up front for the services. And what we've decided to do, because we've unfortunately had a couple negative circumstances where we've done a large amount of work and then we're not paid for it, is that if it's under $100, it's not going to be required any kind of prepayment. We're hoping to move forward with if it's going to be over $100, then we're going to require you pay 50% up front. Mm -hmm. And if I recall correctly, MDOT does do that, something similar to that. Okay, thank you. So. Questions from the committee? Um, I have a couple questions. Um, uh, I guess for, for both agencies, if somebody asks for, let's say, all led, uh, asks for the database of, all lead uh, homes contaminated with the homes contaminated with lead. You do all of the work. It's a thousand dollar request, um, and then somebody comes a week later and asks for the same material. Are they charged the same price? Yes, because we don't make actually like if one PIA request comes in. Even if a week later the same PI request, it's still going to generate the same amount of work. You still have to pull the file out, make the copies so on and so forth. What we are trying to move towards is if we know a particular issue is getting a lot of interest, we try to kind of like red file it so that it's easily accessible and it's not like put back into storage or something like that. 
And then M dot, is there a similar, similar approach? Yeah, I, th I think we would, and, and, and my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we would do pretty much the same thing because we, the, for, I think the odds of somebody actually requesting the exact same thing is actually pretty small, mm -hmm. um, number one. And, but, but number two, we wouldn't keep, you know, we would answer their questions and, you know, it might, it, th that cost might be a little smaller because maybe we can access it a little faster because we know where it is now, but it we would still charge them um, if it's a large amount for the copying and for that type of stuff. As a regulatory agency, in order to maintain the integrity of our case files, we have to keep them together in the same composition that they re originally were. We can pull stuff out, copy it, but we have to get it back in there so that the record remains consistent and the same. Mm -hmm. is, uh, does either agency maintain a database of uh, uh, let's say all of the PIA requests of the 3,000, these are the 3,000, and then a scan of that. So there would be no way to make that accessible once it's been compiled. Let's say it's a group of documents scanned and on the website, here, is the question, here was the question, here was our answer. That's not, that's not no. typically done, is that correct? No. no. We, like I said, we are reviewing to see what, what are the most frequently asked items so that we can try to get as much of that up on the web as possible so we can just direct citizens to the website. Right. And um, I, I, would, I, would, I would agree with what Heather said. I, I do want to just really quickly, um, if, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, Please. Um, uh, touch on something that, that was part of the earlier conversation. A couple of times uh, during the earlier presentation, we referenced the Motor Vehicle Administration and sort of their, their regulations. I want to I point out that the MBA, and I believe they're the only ones, they have separate regs from MDOT proper. Uh -huh. and, and you can probably guess as to why that is. A lot of their information has to do with very confidential driving records and numbers and things like that. And so in order to be able to, to they, they need to sort of run under uh, a higher, uh, a different level of, of, of protection for that information. And so some of the things that, a lot, when I was talking about the MDOT um, process, a lot of it's not specific to the MBA. They have to do things in a slightly different way because of that material. Yeah, thanks. Um, l let me make a suggestion. I, I, um, I, I, I'm the CFO of a company, and I don't do a PDF a copy of every one of the – I do 4,000 invoices to customers every year, and I do not PDF them all. But whatever I scan, I keep in a file so that if somebody asks for it again, I can produce it like that. And I, I guess what I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little troubled by what I heard – um, if someone asks you for a uh, five pages out of a ten page document, I understand that you have to pull those five pages out, copy or scan them, and replace them exactly where you found them. But it seems to me that once you've done that, that document ought to be in a in a database somewhere because you know they're only electrons; they don't take up very much space. So um, I, I think that probably. There ought to be a practice that when something is scanned, and I, my personal view, and I, I haven't, I'm just, um, this is just something I'm coming up with right now because I haven't thought about it prior to this. Whenever any agency of the government scans something, that thing ought to be kept in a, in a database somewhere because, you know, maybe it'll never be requested again, but if it is, there it is. And, uh, and I think the public, it, it, I mean, I think the, uh, uh, Senator F uh, Ferguson is right. I mean, if, if agencies made a practice of putting in some database, here's the PIA request and here's how we responded and just put that someplace, uh, then if someone were to say something like, I'd like to see all your, all your PIA requests and responses for the month of March or for a particular thing, you could, you might be able to just produce it for them very quickly and cheaply and uh, dispose of the request. So, you know, I, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that when we, when we make uh, responses, they ought to be electronic. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to support policy digitizing everything. That would be incredibly expensive. And, and you know what? I don't do it in my workplace. I don't digitize everything. But it seems to me that when something is requested, it ought to be digitized, and if it's digitized, it ought to be kept. That's just that's just my opinion, based on just based on what you said. But I, you know, of course, who knows? Maybe maybe even that's uh, not a good idea. But that's just my suggestion. Thank you. Um, any comments on that? I have a separate question. If there's any thoughts, or I'll take it back. 
Yeah, no, I'd have to look into file. it. Yeah. I know our current database is extremely rudimentary, but we are moving to this new one. So let me, I'll find out from our IT department what they think about that. We'll do the same. Thank you. Um, the, uh, this is a separate issue. Uh, you mentioned that you use OAH. I'm interested in your experience with OAH as the intermediary for con when there is a conflict between the requester and the agency. Um, I'd be interested in MD's perspective of that, that process. Uh, and then MDOT, I don't know if you use OAH. If so, what is your experience? If not, um, why do you not? Well, we do. I mean, we, we, okay. our, our, we OAH is the, um, uh, the, the process for, for, the, for the appeals. Um, I don't know if you all want to speak to. If you could come to the mic, please. And if you could um, just say your name for the record. Sure. Cheryl Brown Whitfield, Deputy Counsel for MDOT. Um, we have, in, in my tenure at MDOT, uh, which has been a little over seven years, never had an appeal on a Public Information Act request um, for the OAH or even for circuit court. Um, usually we are able to resolve the issue with the person that's making the request. Um, and we very carefully review anything that we decide to withhold or redact. Um, and I think that's a sign of us doing a good job that people don't appeal because they know we've made the proper decision. However, we do have appeals for other types of MDOT um, agency decisions. The ones that I'm most familiar with are the ones that are in connection with the Minority Business Enterprise Program. And in that regard, there is delegated authority to the Office of Administrative Hearings for a recommended decision. And what happens is the, um, the ALJ, or Administrative Law Judge, issues a proposed decision that comes to MDOT, and MDOT has to determine whether or not they agree with it. Um, in most instances, I, in fact, in all the instances I'm familiar with, we have accepted the recommended decision. Um, and, and probably because usually we, again, have done a good job and they've basically agreed with what our decision was. However, they are independent. Um, we do have to do legal arguments just as we would in a circuit court, um, and their decisions are not driven by what MDOT has said, but rather by the arguments that the two opposing sides have made. Um, in that process, a person is also allowed, if they don't like the recommended decision, to file exceptions. And those exceptions are then heard by someone at MDOT. Um, after those exceptions are considered, then MDOT determines whether or not they're going to go forward with um, agreeing with the recommended decision or whether they're going to amend it. In many instances, they amend it to a certain extent to reflect how we've considered the actual um, exceptions. And the attorney who works with the client who ultimately makes the it or issues the final decision is not the attorney who was representing MDOT during the proceedings. So we try to sort of put up a Chinese wall um, so that we can give the person who's made the appeal um, as, as, as much of it an, an objective review as, as possible. When you um, deny a PIA request in the past, I know none have been appealed, do you, exp uh, do you give information to the requester, we have denied your appeal, here, or your request, here are your methods for appeal, or do you just deny it? Yeah, for every, for every action that we take where a person has a right to appeal, we tell them their appeal rights, and we explain in the letter the, um, the, the pertinent statute, the pertinent regulation, and we tell them, you know, you can appeal to the Office of Administrative Hearings or you can appeal to, um, uh, to circuit court. And um, in the case of where the person chooses to appeal, um, they would then contact us to find out how. And typically, the way they do it is they submit a written request to the department for the appeal, and then we are responsible for communicating that request to the Office of Administrative Hearings. If it's circuit court, then they would then have to file something in circuit court. Thank you very much. And um, Ms. Barthel, did MDs. Oh, it is Ms. Yeah. Barthel, yes. Can I say ditto? Um, <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> perfect. Um, I have never been directly involved in a PIA, um, you know, denial that went before. I'm not, you know, that's not my role at the agency. Um, I've never heard any complaints from our attorneys with their interactions with OAH. I have been involved with OAH from a different perspective in that I am currently acting as a final decision maker on two cases. 
um, both of which I hope to have wrapped up before the end of the year and session starts. <laughs> um, I, you know, have found them to be very thorough. Um, I, I, I don't have any issues with OAH personally. So. Thank you very much. Okay. Any questions from the committee? Thank you all very much for being here today. Very much appreciate your testimony. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, our last panel will uh, give us the local perspective. Uh, Mr. Michael Sanderson from, uh, from MAKO, uh, Ms. Hillary Ruley from the Baltimore City Assistant City Solicitor's Office, Ms. Heather Price from the Caroline County Attorney's, or a Caroline County Attorney, I'll let you clear, uh, and then Ms. Margaret Ann Nolan from uh, the Howard County Solicitor's Office. Uh, and if we could begin with Mr. Sanderson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the, of the Joint Committee. I'm Michael Sanderson, Director of the Merrill Association of Counties, and I think a lot of the perspective that we'd share with you is ground that you've already heard covered by both Mr. Snyder's overview and insights and from the state agencies. Big picture, the state sets the laws. I think Maryland has a well-balanced and well-conceived set of laws about what things are public and what things are not. Uh, the devil gets into the details. By and large, these rules serve the public and serve the agencies well. My fellow panelists this morning can give you some anecdotes and insight. But to be candid, we're basically in the weeds. When we get into the tricky stories, it's not the routine requests that create the tricky stories. We've basically got those solved, and this group should be pleased that that's an undertone of, of this conversation today. Be before I turn over the microphone to folks who have more to add, I want to add, just make, give one perspective from our organization, the Maryland Association of Counties. This is a topic bubbling up from within our membership as well. We have a conference coming up later this year in December, and one of the things on the agenda for our winter conference is an organizational meeting of what's probably going to become a standing work group on open government practices within county government.